Welcome everyone. Today we are not having a long welcome speech. Uh, we are waiting for the ghetto. And uh, as we all know, there's an eruption on Iceland now. Luckily she got here anyway. Uh, and I don't know why she brought it, but uh, I actually got a gift from her yesterday. It's what? Well, yeah, I think it's sweet. So I have something to uh, drink my coffee from today. So uh, yeah, please pay it up. An hour, one and a half maybe. Thank you. Good morning, thank you for coming uh, at this early hour. Um, I'm sort of happy that we're starting late uh, because I don't think I can uh, manage to talk for one and a half hour with Q&A, even if I like to talk. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. I would have loved to see more people from Turkey, uh, but I heard that nobody goes out on Sundays. So. <laughs> um, and I wanted to talk about democracy. What the hell is democracy? Is it working? and uh, the role of the pirates uh, in creating a, a new hardware for it, and of course, a uh, new software. Um, <coughs> I've been thinking a lot about political parties. I've created two political movements in Iceland uh, in the last five years. I managed to get both of them inside the Valley of the Beasts, like I call my present workplace. Um, uh, with some representatives. Um, it's been a very interesting learning experience about how the system works from inside. I define myself as a hacker inside the parliament. I'm trying to decode both how it works and try to figure out ways to give the people more possibilities of influencing uh, policy making and to hand them the power back if they want to. Uh, I'm a pragmatic anarchist. Um, eventually, my, my goal uh, is to make sure that we have constitutional changes that um, give people this power if they want it. The problem, the reason why I put pragmatic in front of anarchist is that I realized a long time ago that people don't want to have anything to do with decision making. They just want to watch soccer and barbecue. Uh, and um, unfortunately, um, it's very hard. And I think that's the task of the pirates, is to inspire people to be part of the co-creation of their societies. I think that is our responsibility to, to both inspire them uh, and to uh, facilitate the legal and constitutional changes so that democracy works. I don't see democracy working. I don't really feel it is democracy what we're living in. It uh, doesn't matter really where we come from. I don't know, maybe in Switzerland. Uh, but um, and why I say that is that um, the big political parties that have been establishment, they're like you know, Church of Scientology uh, in our societies, um, they give themselves lots of money so that they can maintain their power. Uh, so the biggest parties get the largest amounts of money uh, that they have to give themselves on the budget uh, to carry on having power. And for new parties, it's very difficult. There are massive thresholds, 10% here in Turkey, 5% uh, in most countries, uh, which is not very democratic. Who the hell decided that we should have these thresholds? And why can't we remove them? Uh, online petitions sometimes work, but it's also just often um, um, sort of a, a feel-good action. <laughs> you feel, oh, I've done something. I like that. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, and I've done something today. Um, so, um, how can we change it? And I would really like, you know, once we have q and I want to hear you, uh, your thoughts of it. Because um, the beauty of the Pirate Party movement is that it's a global movement. And, um, and the responsibility of those that have become more advanced, that have more representatives, and some budget, 
is to help the others that are maybe working within much more oppressive uh, situations uh, and live in more oppressive and difficult, com more difficult countries in order to establish themselves. Like in Brazil, you need one million signatures to be able to run. <laughs> can we help? You know, is there a way we can use our networks uh, to help? Many of us have huge Twitter followings or uh, good, good ways to uh, support our fellow pirates. But I think the most important and most needed help is um, that we uh, make our, both our policy platform and our pirate code, which I love, um, accessible in many languages. Uh, because there are such a huge uh, portion of our world that doesn't speak the language I'm speaking now. Um, <coughs> and I think being a part of a global movement uh, like the Pirate Party is uh, one of the reasons why I, I helped co-create and wanted to establish this sort of movement in Iceland. We were lucky to get uh, representatives. Uh, <laughs> it was just a matter of a few votes if we get in or out. Um, and uh, the same was with the EU elections. There were some countries that it was just, we were so close. And uh, we really need to support our representative in the EU parliament because within the EU we um, see many of the really bad laws being made. Uh, and, but we can also facilitate the lobby for you know, good stuff that is not uh, created as a reaction, but uh, as something that uh, sets the course. That was the case with the Atlantic Modern Media Initiative. It set the course before we had the problems. So it is a lot easier to actually, in Iceland, when, for example, we, uh, when the data retention ruling, uh, are you all familiar with the data retention ruling? Um, when that was ruled um, uh, out, then uh, I was ready with the bill, uh, which I presented for a committee in the parliament. And because I came to the meeting with a piece of paper with the solution, the committee was very open to get rid of data retention measures. So we need to, like, if we're going to change our democracies, we have to have a very comprehensive strategy. And I feel that it is slightly lacking because one of the things that if I may criticize my fellow pirates in Iceland and elsewhere is that people are too eager to have posts everywhere. Whereas like building the movement uh, sort of uh, doesn't get the necessary attention. And uh, for me, it's not about um, getting as many people into posts as possible because that can be disastrous if it if uh, the grassroots are not ready for it. One of the things we really need to develop if we really care about democracy is uh, experimentation, research, uh, and uh, tests, uh, real tests with uh, liquid democracy or liquid feedback. And we need to rename it because nobody understands what it means. But yeah, it's, it's, I don't know what it means. So you have to sort of explain it to people uh, in detail and then they get it. But you don't necessarily, you shouldn't have to. So we need to come up with a, a better way of expressing what it means. I think when I've explained it, like I, I remember I was in New York like a year and a half ago uh, and I met with uh, Thomas Drake. And he's known to be the serious whistleblower. Like he's always very serious. Uh, and it was the first time that I saw him being really enthusiastic when I was explaining to him uh, transferable voting systems uh, because he could see that that would be a way for us to transform our uh, democracies. And uh, from sort of this established institutionalized uh, dictatorship with many hats pretending that we have um, a say every four years and then when things are fucked up like in Iceland, uh, Iceland is not it is not by any means the fucking promised land. We are just as fucked up as everybody else. Uh, we did some things right after the collapse, but almost everything we did right is being changed again by the current government. Because lo and behold, uh, the Icelandic people decided to elect the same fuckwits that fucked up Iceland before the election, uh, before the financial collapse. So we now have the same corrupt, corrupt people in power 
And just for an example, um, and one of the reasons uh, I have to go back is because we are the pirates, pirate party in Iceland are preparing an indictment on the uh, interior minister because uh, her ministry and, and her assistant has been charged uh, by leaking information uh, to the press about asylum seeker, uh, really personal stuff. And uh, she refused that nothing happened. She applied, actually uh, this just happened last week, uh, that the ombudsman of the parliament, uh, he uh, is going into deeper research on her conduct because uh, she had called the head of police uh, to meetings, uh, threatening the head of the chief of police with uh, a, re uh, um, a research uh, into his research or investigation, um, and she's still standing. She's still a minister. In incredible. And uh, we claim we're very democratic. Uh, and she is no longer uh, uh, a justice minister. The prime minister is now the justice minister with a uh, ministry within the ministry. It's just, you know, how can they come up with these things? Uh, and I really hope that uh, that we don't define democracy by these uh, parameters. Democracy, for me, is what the word means, the rule of the people, or the rule of the mob. And what does that mean? Is the mob or the people uh, capable of ruling themselves? Are they smart enough? Are they responsible enough uh, to have a say in their policy making? Can they be responsible for the budget? Uh, should we put um, you know, issues of minority and human rights into direct democracy? Uh, you know, where do we draw the line? I personally don't think we should put the issues of human rights into uh, direct democracy uh, because well, the development I'm seeing in Europe is very troubling is that you have when people have completely lost faith in um, the state when they have completely lost faith in the representative system what do we get what happened before second world war what happened exactly what's happening now and so can we play a role in creating something different a new hardware, a new way to uh, engage and re-establish trust in the systems we have, or do we want to carry on with the systems we have? Are we happy with the systems we have? Is the healthcare system great? Is the educational system great? Is uh, the banking system great? Why is there so much unemployment? Um, do will we ever get paid our pension funds? I think so. <laughs> that we're being robbed in a constitutional way or you know, in a legal way every month when they take a portion of our salary into our pension funds. Um, so, I mean, there's lots of uh, incredibly interesting uh, aspects uh, that we can um, dig into and start to develop solutions for. But, um, before that, I think it's fundamental, if we want to get people into, if we want to get more representatives in national uh, assemblies, uh, I think it's important to have a very clear uh, policy that defines the speciality of the pirates. And uh, I think the reason why we are often not being able to get people to vote for pirates is that they all of a sudden start to focus on uh, fringe policies uh, that are great in itself, but uh, sound a little bit too utopian for the general public to feel confident that uh, we can execute that promise. And I think it's very important, if there is one thing uh, I've tried to do uh, in the election campaigns, and when we are um, establishing policies both for my the civic movement uh, and the art party is not to promise something I can't keep, <laughs> you know, or that I can't. If I'm in power, 
or even if I'm in opposition, to not promise stuff that I know I can never achieve uh, in my lifetime. So, um, but is that good? Because the other parties are always promising stuff that uh, they're never going to keep. So, uh, do we stand a chance if we are honest? <laughs> so, I think uh, you know um, we should, uh, because I noticed one of the things that has been the strength of just putting on ordinary people that don't have a politician or a prime minister sleeping in their belly wanting to come out uh, is that we just talk like the rest of them and people like that. Uh, I remember during the election campaign um, when I was with the civic movement uh, one of the candidates was um, on live, in a live debate and, and she was asked a very complex sort of financial question and she just said well, you know, I don't know, but I'm going to find out. <laughs> and we actually went up in the polls. <laughs> because people like politicians uh, or people that are representing them, to be honest. And that is the beauty of the Pirate Party movement. Uh, and I think we should really sort of uh, focus more on that, is that we are willing to learn and seek knowledge and share knowledge. And I hope that we're also willing to change our mind if somebody gives us a better argument. That's at least what I do. Uh, if I'm giving a better argument, uh, I'm willing to open my mind to change my mind. Uh, and that is normal for human beings and societies. Now I want to talk to you about uh, democracy as if you, like one of the things that I realized when we had the financial collapse in Iceland is that uh, society is just like a human being. Uh, and the reason why I realized that was that uh, we had the collapse and we had a really proper, really decent, juicy crisis that hit us really quickly. Uh, and these are the best times for changes. Now, if any of you have ever had a personal crisis, somebody close to you died, you illness, or whatever, uh, you, that's the time when you're willing to make some personal changes in your life. That's the wake-up call. It's exactly the same with society. But if you don't act on it immediately, you will just carry on on your path. And the same with society. So when we have crisis, we have to be ready. We absolutely have to be ready. The guys that wrote the Patriot Act, they didn't do it the day after 9-11. That was prepared years before. That was prepared by many, many people that had lots of time and resources to do that. And when 9-11 hit, it was just, it went through the uh, uh, Congress like this. Nobody knew what's in it. They're still dealing with the consequences of it. So the only reason I managed to get the Icelandic media, modern media, through the parliament is because we did it really quickly. And we worked it in a really nice way because it was crowdsourced. Uh, and not only crowdsourced, what we did, we put together a group from all over the world. We worked with Amelia, she went and studied uh, the EU laws that we needed to look into when we were sort of cherry picking all the best laws for freedom of information, expression of speech and uh, privacy. And uh, we managed to wrap it up quickly just because we wrote it in an ether pad. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and hence, you know, obviously in the years that it's taken to implement it, uh, laws, we have seen some of the laws are not sticking, like the, the U.S. whistleblowing act is not really working, <laughs> so we had to start to look at other whistleblowing acts. Um, and, uh, but it's a good way to do stuff, to work together, and we should do more of that, the pirates from around the world. We should do more of working in scouting for the best laws. Uh, I was looking at uh, the internet party's uh, policies, the internet party in New Zealand, and I think that they are um, they are applying similar methods. Like they were, I was looking at the, their copyright um, uh, policy and open access policy, and uh, I noticed that they've been sort of looking at the, the best practicing copyright stuff. And even if they have a different name, they're still pirates. Uh, and uh, we have pirates or people with uh, very similar aspirations everywhere. And I don't really give a damn what they call themselves. <laughs> uh, it's not about the brand. It is about what we will do with our ideology. And we are, have an ideology. Uh, and it's 
an ideology uh, of uh, not only involving like all the questions that we're dealing with, uh, the copyright questions, the open access questions, the freedom of, of uh, information, the privacy, it is all about human rights. And that's how we need to express it. Uh, we need to get it out of the geeky language uh, and get it into the human interest categories with the media. Like, I remember before Snowden, uh, we were trying to talk about privacy stuff. And uh, the timing wasn't right, because if you would talk about, we all knew what Snowden knew, you know, or m many of my friends. But you couldn't express it. It wasn't until he released the facts that it became a human interest story. It wasn't only in the task part of the newspapers. It was actually on the front pages as a human interest story. And I think uh, if we can figure out ways to get the stuff that we find to be very important and we're sort of ahead of our time uh, with, if we can get it into um, the human interest categories, you know, uh, and then I'm not talking about internal pirate drama, <laughs> uh, but, you know, the important stuff. Um, and I think then, like, for example, now we are at this time where uh, people are delusioned, they feel the systems we've created are not working for us. Shouldn't we then be working extremely hard, really creating pirate party think tanks where we come and we do brainstorm and we have some results from the brainstorm in creating that new hardware for society? Because I'm not going to participate again in bringing new software in a, you know an old desk heap. Doesn't work. Our systems, our systems that we created a hundred years ago, don't work for the amount of people that are supposed to fit in. And so my main message is for the pirates of the world is that we need to collaborate more. We need to figure out ways to reach out to people um, that are not necessarily pirates but have expertise in many different fields. For example, when I was working on the data retention, uh, I met with Natasha, and I've never remembered her people's last names. Uh, she used to be the information commissioner for Slovenia for eight years. And I met with her when I went to Slovenia as I was sort of wrapping up the, you know, the, the riddle of the data retention removal. And she gave us some really important insight. And I would really like to reach out to her, you know, again, I reached out to her through IMI. I'm very lucky I can have like, many different hats. So I can say, oh, I'm just the chairperson for the National Motor Media Institute. Uh, and then you can get experts to help uh, more easily because for some awkward reason the institutions of political parties have made it so that uh, uh, it's hard to get expert advice because people are afraid to affiliate themselves with political parties and that is something we need to tackle as well uh, my ideal democracy would be in such a way that we would uh, inspire people to co-create their societies and it starts with the little communities um, and then it can be expanded into the larger system uh, or you know system installment new system installment um, we need to be more so self-sufficient and at the same time we need to utilize the connectivity we have and it's, uh, it was actually, I was reading um, when I was preparing for talking today uh, or, you know, on this thought of direct democracy which I'm passionate about. I don't know if it's going to work or not, but I was uh, looking up uh, Buckminster Fuller. I don't know if you know who he is. But in 1940, he was talking about um, direct democracy through the telephone. So you could vote through your telephone. Uh, and then he, uh, uh, as we had um, technology advance, uh, he expanded it uh, into easier methods than telephones. So this idea has been with visionaries for a long time. And I strongly encourage you to find the book 
but Bachman has to follow I found it on a PDF. Uh, it's called No Second Hand God, and it's a poem, a beautiful poem uh, about direct democracy. Uh, and uh, look him up, he's an incredibly uh, interesting person uh, that will way, way ahead of his time. Um, and he believed that people could be smart enough uh, and informed enough to uh, have a say in their society. Uh, one of the strongest ways to establish uh, more direct democracy and re-establish our um, societies is to work on constitutional changes. And we went quite far with that in Iceland. We, we managed to, uh, in a sense, it was not a 100% crowdsourced constitution. The process uh, has been well documented, uh, but it was a con constitutional council uh, counseling with the nation uh, about the social agreement of what sort of society we want to be. Now, um, why should we, why, why don't we, as pirates, uh, start projects like that, to start that conversation in our communities and in our countries? What sort of nation do you want to be? What sort of world do we want to have in 50 years or 100 years? Do we? Do we make policies that are based on that idea that we might exist in, or you know, the, our ancestors in a hundred years? What sort of world do we want to have? Where are we going? Do we know? Does anybody have a clue? Because I don't. But it's starting to come by talking to people, by asking them, what do you want to be in a hundred years, twenty years, fifty years? Just don't tell me where you're going to be in a year, because I don't care, <laughs> if you know what I mean. It's like, politics is all about four-year terms. It's like the world ends after that. It's crazy. I don't want to participate in that sort of bullshit. Uh, so, I think we can change our societies. I know that individuals can change this world, and I know it is the responsibility of the individual to change the world. And that applies to every single one of you. You have that responsibility. And so how can we, faci we facilitate this change? So I have lots of questions for you. I'm not going to have this longer because I get very bored in hearing my own voice. Um, so uh, I'm just going to open for Q&A now. Thank you. That I get many questions. <laughs> first of all, thank you for a great talk. Um, and second, you basically say that before we go on and talk about liquid democracy, we should experience that. But maybe before we experience liquid democracy, we need to understand uh, our philosophy, or should I say, even our ethos, our theology, our ethics, because, for example, no liberalism or any other uh, political movement like uh, capitalism or communism, uh, it's, first of all, it's a question of philosophy. And we think we understand what we as pirates, what our philosophy is, but I don't really show if that is the case. And what I'm going to say next may be contradicting, but uh, in many ways uh, you talk, we have to prepare ourselves to the catastrophe. But maybe we should think of the world we are living as who we are already in that catastrophe. And the pirate movement, in my opinion, is the reaction to that catastrophe, is the practice, even more than the philosophy, uh, in its way to uh, answer or how to act in a world of uh, ongoing catastrophe, democratic catastrophe. That's just my thoughts. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I agree with, uh, maybe you misunderstood me a little bit, but I agree with um, uh, both that we need to have a really strong foundation to base our ideology. 
We need to have an ideology. We have to acknowledge that what we do is based on ideology. Everything, like whenever we are trying to get people to be interested in uh, the stuff we're selling them, we are, you know, trying to get them to buy our ideas. <laughs> you know, that is what politicians do. They are battling for ideologies. And if we don't have a clear ideology and people are not clear about who we are, then they're not going to trust us. That's basically number one. Uh, the second one is that I, I think we are not practicing properly with democracy because it's, it's lacking one component, uh, component, which is the ability to discuss the ideas in advance in an open fashion. And I think that uh, I really like when the Icelandic Paris, we haven't even started to use it. Uh, which I'm very disappointed uh, that we haven't been able to find the, the energy to do what needs to be done. Uh, I think there are some platforms, direct democracy initiative platforms, uh, with good open source skins for the conversation part. It's very important be because most people, you know, are not going to be interested in just voting without being able to bring forward ideas on amendments or questions and so forth. So I think uh, we need to make it more accessible for the general public. Uh, and for ourselves, I mean, there are not a lot of pirates that ha have had like a hands-on experience with it, and we need to develop how we're going to, and have a really clear idea how we're going to make this model work, because it is a very fascinating uh, model. I really like the idea behind it, how you can sort of transfer your votes to different individuals based on their expertise. I think it's a great idea. So I'm hoping, uh, you know, and this is another thing which I find to be very positive about uh, the Pirate Party working with the academia. Like, you know, here we are in a university in Turkey that uh, hopefully there will be some, some research uh, and maybe somebody will do their thesis or BA or whatever uh, based on some of the ideas that we are discussing in the Pirate Party movie movement uh, as solutions. So, uh, we need to experiment more with it, but uh, uh, I don't know, maybe the German pirates can inform uh, about the experiment they've done with it, uh, and maybe they will do so later today, or we can do it here in this discussion, uh, because um, um, maybe if we apply our heads, lots of heads to it, we can experiment with it on, in a global way, you know, or something, but we have to make it work globally as well. Yeah, I think uh, I can respond to that directly. I, I really do want to uh, try to use liquid democracy as a tool for, for um, global development of ideas because I think this is really um, one of the big challenges of globalization that we're facing at the moment because, I mean, clearly the, the pirates are not an anti-globalization movement. They come out of the internet, which is uh, a product of globalization. And um, at the same time, uh, I am also in Istanbul right now to attend an event, the Internet Governance Forum, where there are um, systems outside of uh, traditional parliamentary democracy that are discussing about how the internet itself is being governed. And um, something that I've also seen in the Snowden revelations is that a lot of the people, even though they are shocked by, by the revelations of global surveillance, uh, don't even see how our existing democratic structures can do anything about it because um, the, the problems that exist uh, and uh, the network of uh, secret services is not being controlled on a national level anymore. So we really do need to, uh, to experiment with uh, systems of transnational democracy. And I think um, being uh, a member of the European Parliament, I can actually put some resources into that and try to get uh, pirates from different European countries to build such a system together. Um, in Germany, uh, I would say that, that our experiment with, uh, with liquid democracy is really just working um, in particular areas where there is uh, 
uh, where it is tied to a presence in parliament. Um, we are not in a national parliament and hence the, uh, the uh, well, making policies on a national level doesn't really lead anywhere. Whereas, for example, in Berlin, um, the, the members of parliament on a state level can use the input they get from uh, liquid feedback for their actual parliamentary work. And um, since we are represented in the European Parliament, I think this is also something we can try to do because it's not just that people want to um, do more than vote. I absolutely agree with you that it's crucial that we see liquid democracy not as a purely as a decision-making tool, but as a development tool for ideas. And um, but they also uh, people also want to see results if they want to participate. They want to do more than simply have uh, the great democratic right to edit a wiki page. They want to have uh, the the right to participate in actual decisions. And um, so I think if we want to be successful with such democratic experiments, um, it's necessary to also try to find okay, what can we actually do with these results? and how can we make it uh, attractive for people to participate. And um, yeah, in, I think also one thing that has really hindered uh, liquid democracy in the German Pirate Party is that we try to first make it absolutely perfect before we are willing to, to um, base some decisions on it. So um, we have never really gotten past this issue of uh, trying to balance transparency and privacy and um, I think at some point you have to, to also be able to compromise and to simply uh, try something out and experiment with something and uh, hopefully we can do better on the European level. Well, this is good news. <laughs> uh, and uh, I would be really awesome if we can actually do experimentation. We more than have to be part of it. Um, and uh, because, like I said earlier, it's our strength that we have a global movement with many different both successes and failure stories about our societies. And if we can pull these resources together more, uh, I think uh, we can move much quicker uh, through all these red tapes that we are experiencing. Uh, in relation to uh, crisis mode, is that there is, when you have this one particular moment of massive crisis, you have like a society rips open and you have that possibility or that evolutionary change. Uh, it can be for good or for bad, and I'm a client, she goes very deeply into it uh, in her book, uh, The Shock Doctrine. And uh, why I was referring to the crisis, I mean, like, of course we are having an ongoing crisis, but sometimes we have uh, like a catastrophe, 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 <laughs> uh, and uh, something that rattles belief systems and, and what people feel is their security. And that's when you get them to come and demand change. Uh, it's part of this uh, revolutionary thing. It's when we have the R in front of the E. Um, yeah, but I think we, it's really great to have uh, somebody in the EU Parliament. I'm really glad that we at least got one. <laughs> you're going to have, uh, you're going to need a lot of support. Uh, because also when you go inside the system and you haven't been there before, uh, you realize that you know those that might be the friendliest are the ones that are actually trying to um, stab you in the back. <laughs> it's that's the disgusting realization uh, in politics once you're inside. You know the people there are they are very competitive uh, and very much willing to uh, uh, make life difficult for you. Um, so uh, yeah, more questions. I, uh, if we're talking about a crisis, that we have to be ready for a next crisis. So what do you see as the next kind of global crisis that we need to be ready for? Uh, I don't really know. I mean, there are some talks about uh, various forms of uh, financial collapses. I think financial stuff is the best crisis because it really shakes people up. <laughs> so I'm, I'm hoping for a good financial crisis, but we have to be ready. I mean, you see what happened in Greece. I mean, people were not ready with any solutions. Uh, and it's a dreadful situation. I mean, they had a very similar uh, collapse as we did, but there were very different ways of dealing with it. They even had the same horrible IMF guy as we did. 
we had him first. I called him the man with the fist hand. Uh, because he didn't shake your hand and it was a breakthrough. Uh, uh, anyway, so um, there is also, I mean, we might have a massive volcanic eruption in Iceland that would destroy the crop in, uh, you know, France uh, or anywhere else in Europe. We don't know. I mean, it's like, uh, and that's the nature of crisis. Uh, you don't know. Uh, so you be prepared, you know, with the stuff that you want to have changed. It doesn't matter what it is. I, I didn't know that data retention would be all, like, deemed illegal, uh, but I was still ready uh, uh, because I had a feeling that it would. I mean, if we would have another banking crisis, you should be ready with community banking or all go on a quest to Mantragon and figure out how they do cooperatives that work. Uh, you know, the, we just need to sort of have a bank of bills. You know, be prepared with bills, the actual stuff that we want to have changed, or amendments to current bills, or, you know, the, the skeleton of a constitution, if we want to have, go on a campaign to talk about how we want to have our societies. But we have to just, and this is what we do well, pirates. We have all sorts of wikis and stuff, and kind of law wikis. Uh, I've talked about this for quite a while, that uh, we need to share it, and we have to start to uh, have a really sort of, um, like, I just uh, use some of the resources from the parliamentary group to uh, translate the Finnish citizen uh, initiative uh, for copyright reform, so you're more than welcome to get that translated, uh, or anybody else. Uh, I, I had it translated to English rather than Atlantic, so I could share it, because it's a lot easier to translate from English than Finnish. <laughs> uh, and then we can sort of, but I don't know where to share it with the pirates. Where, where would I post this so that it would sort of be available for everybody uh, if they are searching for copyright stuff? So I mean it's like um, um, if we can make that more easy for us, even this little group that we are, uh, to share. So it's okay. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, does everybody know that here, that that would be the time, like I want to have it in a permanent place when I'm as a, either a parliamentarian, grassroots, academia, whatever, to go and roots. This is uh, the stuff that, you know, this is our policies and legal changes, suggestions, stuff. But part of times is good, but it's not the permanent sort of house of the digital house of parts. <laughs> yes. Um, at the beginning of your talk you pointed out that um, we are an international movement, right? But uh, we are not all at the same level. Uh, some countries have developed a stronger pirate movement, uh, which is maybe a little <laughs> bit advanced and others are just starting to build it up. And then you said, yes, we should, of course, support those. Let's say, support the pirates in Turkey, support the pirates uh, in, in, in other countries that are not so advanced, like Iceland, Sweden, and Germany, which are, in my eyes, the, the strongest countries in the pirate movement. And I think that that is a very, very good uh, task for the PPI to do, mm -hmm. because um, when, you, when you look at the discussion about um, liquid democracy and especially liquid feedback. If you only um, uh, look at it in Germany, then you get the impression that liquid feedback is the only tool. But then on the international level you will learn, okay, the uh, Iceland uh, pirates, they have uh, Vasa to Ill. Um, the uh, Switzerland have de has developed their own system. The Swedish pirate parties got the online, um, online <laughs> assemblies. So um, I think that we should, yes, uh, especially on, on things like liquid democracy or on stuff like um, the, the NSA regulations, which are already on a global scale because they're, they're referring to every country, we should more uh, work on the international level um, and, 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 and try to get the best ideas from the, the different parties and put together. And that is one of, the, um, one of the core things that the PPI can do, building that network. But to do that, of course, they, they also need some, some financing. So um, <clears throat> that would be, in my eyes, very important 
to sort it out what is the PPU, what is the, the, the goals for the PPU, what are the goals for the PPI, maybe for the PPU it is more like concentrate on the issues in the European Parliament and for the PPI more doing international networking and then like sort out the mailing lists and stuff to have uh, a common channel where we can discuss the issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. And no further comments. First of all, thank you for, for the talk. I believe that we share a lot of the, the issues raised, especially regarding how pirates reacted to crisis. Um, the first pirates elected in Sweden were elected because of a copyright crisis. Mm -hmm. The first German pirates elected were because of a, a Censor, um, debate, uh, censorship debate. Uh, the pirates in Iceland were elected during times of crisis. No. No? No. <laughs> okay, then I, I, I saw it wrong from, from the outside. No, I, I, was, I, I created, my first I helped co create the civic movement, uh, <coughs> and then it was just a hit and run movement. And then in the elections last year, it was not, um, I think it was just, you know, because many people. I don't know why you were elected. Actually, there were lots of competition. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's take Iceland out of, of the of the question. Then, um, if if we are looking at the successes that pirate movements around the world had, it was mostly then. I want to say always, but mostly around times of crisis, because the pirates offered one solution mm -hmm. to a topic that was currently uh, debated very um, very strongly in their community. That was not always the same issue. It was not always the same solution that they brought. So we also need to be prepared to see opportunities and to move into the, those opportunities. That means, in my opinion, that we are not only we don't only have the need to prepare um, a registry of, of issues and replies to those issues, but we also need some sort of um, watch mechanism mm -hmm. to see where new opportunities could arise. Uh, Snowden, the writing on the wall, was clear well before the revelations. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the pirate parties internationally did not or were not able to respond to that issue quickly. So we left one core issue out of the public debate or at least we lost the opportunity to present pirates as an alternative. Mm -hmm. So we also need some sort of being ready to move into new opportunities, be that because of revelations, be that because of crisis. Um, you cited the banking crisis. I believe that there are um, infrastructures in Europe that are far more um, unreliable than we think they are uh, regarding power grid, communication technology, uh, which, if they would fall, would be far more catastrophic than uh, the banking system. Because even without banks, they are still a farmer producing food. Um, so we also need to look into those issues, where even the major parties have no replies to how to react. If we can find the competence to, to answer those currently not really debated topics, and have them ready the moment they become acute, if we will have a chance to move into new domains where currently nobody has any competence. So instead of always talking about how we change the internet or how we want to change the internet, that's a nice topic, but everybody believes the pirates that we are experts on the internet, even if it's only for trolling. What we need is to establish credibility in other domains, be that uh, energy sector, be that uh, the finance world. Uh, most pirates do not want to talk to CEOs because, oh no, those are lobbyists. But we need to engage them. We need to know how they see the world so that we can react to their worldview. And I believe that this is something we should really try to do. And I see some pirates internationally that are doing exactly that, which I applaud. But most of the basis pirates, the so-called, in Germany, the, the Badenspiraten, are actually those that are currently saying, oh no, you can't meet with a CEO because then uh, you could be influenced. But yeah, of course, we are exchanging ideas. 
that I am, of course, influenced. And we need to somehow give an explanation to the, to as well our basis to tell them this is why we are doing it, this is why it's important to do it. And on the other hand, pirate leaders need to assume leadership and also engage controversial topics instead of simply repeating what the basis wants to hear. Because if we only repeat what they want to hear, then we are not better than any other politician. Sometimes we need to challenge also our core beliefs. And this was now a, a big statement, sorry for that. But no, no, no. no I, will, I believe that yeah. everything is a little bit connected to that, to say we need a registry with uh, proposals ready to be published. We need to have uh, communication channels that are not bogged down by trolls. Oh, yeah. uh, I, I'm not reading PB in general, I'm not reading PBI leaders anyway, because there are too much discussions that nobody wants to lead anyway. We need uh, repositories that simply work. We need uh, infrastructure that simply works. We don't need to have the tool discussions all over again. We don't need to talk about which voting system is the best. In the end, simply do it. Simply get shit done. <laughs> That's something we are lacking. So we need to become far more agile. Exactly. I totally agree. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think uh, there's another thing I'm always thinking when, like, when you're on all these nailing this. It's like you're constantly listening into conversations on the phone. Imagine if you would have to sit and listen to conversations like that on the telephone. Uh, and so we need to sort of it's the same amount of time that goes into it. And you are actually playing the voices in your head, like how they are talking and stuff. And so it makes you crazy. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, in general, it is. Uh, I once read a very interesting book by John Perkins. Uh, he did the book uh, Confessions of uh, an Economic Hitman. Um, I to. But he wrote another book that very few people have read, which is called uh, Shape Shifting. Uh, where he discusses the importance of actually, you know, shape shifting and understanding, going inside the different systems, also the, the uh, you know, how the corporate people think, because you have to understand how they're thinking. You don't have to become like them. That's not necessary. But you have to, just like you know, I went in. I never like wanted to become a parliamentarian. It was the, I didn't. It wasn't even on the checklist of things that I wanted to do. I wanted to write a great novel. <laughs> you know. So uh, uh, I think um, if you have people around you that you can trust, that can tell you if you are changing into something horrible because you are inside the establishment, then that's very useful. That's the most useful advice that I, I can give people that are going inside the different sort of uh, uh, values of the beast. Uh, but it's very important as well because I remember I was uh, in Germany, um, I was in Germany at a sort of uh, activist literature festival, and uh, there was a guy in the panel with me who used to be in the, the chief executive or something for Greenpeace, and now he's working. Guess what? He's working. He's an advisor to fucking McDonald's. And I mean, it's like, please don't think that's okay. Because like, and I was trying to tell him that was not okay. I was very disturbed about this because it's exactly what happens to organizations when they become too big, you know. And they completely devaluate Greenpeace, in my opinion, when this, this happens. It's become way too big anyway in Canada. Um, but, you know, I agree with all the stuff and all the points you came with. Uh, and um, we really need to stop analyzing the small stuff. I was just thinking about that earlier, but we really need to stop being so caught up in the, the, the details. We have a mission and a role to play in the bigger picture. The details, they will sort themselves out, and we are allowed to make mistakes. We will learn from them. More questions? Yeah, I have one. You mentioned uh, uh, Patriot Act had been a long time in the making, really, and then it only it, it took of some major changes taking place for that thing to get enacted. Uh, and you make the argument, so next changes may be coming, we need to be prepared so we can make use of that momentum, right? Mm -hmm. So do you see that kind of preparation also in the established leaders or elected leaders or what have you at this moment? 
leaders from other parties? Or oh, whatever, no, maybe this is a question for Julie as well. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure if this is just day-to-day -day management trying to get our Europe or our countries managed on a day-to-day -day basis, or is there some People new patriotic kind of things <laughs> being hammered out already? Well, I don't know, uh, like, because you know, I'm, at least they're not doing it in Iceland. Uh, <laughs> uh, but um, you know, in general, the problem with uh, politicians is that they are not the ones that are writing these things. It is not the politicians, it is the lobbyists, uh, it is the corporations, it's the military cartel or whatever. Uh, it's not the politicians. I mean, laws are never written by politicians. Uh, I mean, lawmakers are just processing laws from the ministries. That's sort of, except maybe in Holland, where there is a, an established initiative where, you know, the parliamentarians uh, put forward laws and they're accepted. <laughs> in Iceland this hardly never happens. So it's just with IME that we have to the first time in the history of Iceland that we could take through a parliamentary proposal that was course defining on where the country was heading. Never happened before, but it, a lot of it has happened now because, you know, I sort of challenged the, <coughs> the people that are in the majority to do the same thing. Um, and it is, I mean, there are some really great organizations that are working on shedding light on the lawmaking process. Uh, and that's one thing that pirates have not really gotten deep into that discussion. Uh, and even, I remember the minister of, uh, I think it was the interior minister in Holland said that uh, at some conference with journalists of all people when he was testifying that uh, they shouldn't uh, sort of have made, improve the Freedom of Information Act in Holland. The balls are like a sausage. You don't want to see what's in it. And uh, well, you know, I want to see what's in it. <laughs> I don't want to eat that sausage unless I know what's in it. Um, yeah. So that's another field that will be really interesting to actually know who writes what in the laws before we process it. That should be an obligation. But when I just there was a guy that called me uh, uh, two weeks ago in Iceland. We the pirates in Iceland. We no, it was Imi that didn't want to have drones in Iceland. And uh, an old colleague, we used to own a uh, sort of a computer company together, or an internet company together in 95, which of course went bankrupt. Um, he, he, he called me and said, uh, I'm in charge, or like my company is in charge of you know, uh, drones in Iceland. And I have been, you know, and he, he voted for pirates and he said, I'm, I'm gonna lobby against police getting access to drones. Uh, but he told me, and I was like, fuck, you know, like, I've been asked to write the regulation for it, or a device on it. And I was like, this is the problem with regulations and laws. They're written by the people that have, that are stakeholders. And people don't know about that. If I would, if he had not called me, I would have never known that when we get that regulations or that law about drones, it's written by the guy that's important them to us. <laughs> All right, so we have two minutes. Who wants to know the last question? Yes, of course. Uh, first, the digression. Uh, Sven, everything you said would be recorded. Yeah. Because it was, was important. Thank you very much. Um, you have mentioned a lot, uh, and somebody believed that it was maybe the ice save uh, scandal uh, that made uh, the parts on Iceland a success. I know it was not. Uh, but you mentioned, uh, or you talked a lot about the banking system and financial system. Uh, we have actually been discussing a couple of pirates internationally to actually try to build a pirate party bank or financial institution. Do you think that could be a solution? No, uh, I think we should uh, really help establish community banks. Uh, you know, banks that are based on a cooperative model that support that community. Uh, we need to, like, there used to be banks like that, uh, but Every, all laws that are made are, you know, the subject of manipulation of uh, selfish bastards. 
Um, so, you know, we're never going to be able to write code or legal code uh, that is going to uh, prevent hacking. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the closer to the community stuff is, the better it is. Um, I think uh, the Atlantic Pirate Party was so successful because Maori is so charming and... Uh, <laughs> and uh, no, I mean, we were just, uh, I think we appealed a lot to young people that just felt completely not represented. Uh, I had, of course, some personal following from, you know, I've been, um, um, you know, not that well, I've been quite controversial, I don't know. I, I don't really know why we have people in, it was just the timing. We, we were, we had fun. We actually, that was the most important thing. We were very innovative. We had our office because we didn't have any money at the local flea market. We asked people to give us their used stuff and we sold that and made balloons, uh, balloon sports. And gave children and their parents felt very thankful. <laughs> 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 uh, no, it's uh, the, the reason why we got in is that we utilized everything, like we were very nifty and thriving, like uh, thrifty about the little stuff we had. Um, and, uh, but in general, I think the more ideas and the more experimentation, that is the nature of pirates, is to experiment and try out things. Uh, we shouldn't be afraid to fail if we're willing to learn from it. I think it's the most important message right now. Uh, and, but, and, and all the stuff we talk about, the, the PPI, you know, the role of it, uh, is very important. And, and please do not lose hope. If things don't uh, turn out the way you wanted them to turn out uh, in the next three years or two years or, or five years, the most important thing is to have a vision. Where the hell are we going to get them? Thank you. So, so one last comment. Prepare to be surprised. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Not just from the party, but focuses on something else. We risk being quite boring, so we will try to minimize this, and we will somehow try to make our research more interesting if we can manage to. Before everything, thanks to Istanbul uh, Commerce University for hosting this and inviting us and accepting our proposal. Uh, as the title suggests, uh, the research that me and my two colleagues, Oral and uh, Brock, have conducted and, uh, is basically about media related NGOs in Turkey. So media related, as, uh, as it connotes, is a very broad definition. Uh, therefore, it includes many different organizations, movements, platforms, associations, foundations. One of them, actually, the one that we have conducted the uh, most recent interview is the Pirate Party movement in Turkey. Uh, but it is not limited to the parties. It is um, about different forms and kinds of NGOs that operate somehow related to media field. Um, Turkish uh, media field, media landscape is rich itself and the similar richness or the crowdedness can be found in the NGOs as well because we really have different forms and different focuses of um, NGOs operating in audiovisual media sector, print media field and online media and the others. So, there are tens of organizations, associations, movements, platforms, and these uh, their activities are either directly related to diverse aspects of media or somehow touch upon the media field. And uh, yet the majority of these organizations, not all of them, are somehow working with the idea or with the aim of uh, democratizing or empowering the media environment in their definitions. Of course, not all of them are like that. There are many NGOs which have more, let's say, discussable or negative impacts on the field as well. But in this research that we want to uh, conduct in, in a longer time period, we want to create a kind of topography of these NGOs and try to create a kind of map where different organizations can be seen and their activities, their, um, the challenges that they face and their, let's say, forms of organization can be seen in a more macro way. Um, so the primary focus of our research is uh, on the causes and existence of the uh, NGOs. Why there are such NGOs? 
what do they do, what is their existential reason, why are they established, so what is the main question on the first level. On the second level, uh, we focus on the how question, which uh, relates to the organizational uh, activities, financial uh, structure, so how do, they these, how do they do, how do they achieve, or at least try to achieve uh, the what question, the existential reasons of their being. And finally, Okay, and then the third, let's say, level of the question relates to the with whom question, because with whom actually relates to the relational as, as aspects of the field, therefore it's it becomes a kind of mapping or topography. Who are their allies, or who are their competitors, uh, what kind of organizations do they establish within the country, on the, li the, the local or regional and national level, as well as the international level. So th th these three questions are intended to be answered throughout the research, which are what, how, and with whom. The method so far that we uh, used is the secondary sources. Um, these are the documents that exist about uh, hundreds or tens of organizations, as well as the in-depth interview with the organizations themselves. So based on these two, let's say, uh, sources, um, our intention on long term is creating a really uh, extensive uh, and including uh, big map of, on the national level. But so far, as I said, this is the, the, the results and the findings that we will present today uh, here are uh, based on the pilot project that we have conducted so far. So the intention is after this pilot research, creating a kind of uh, revision and then submitting to a bigger organizational body and with a bigger funding. We intend to do this a two or three year longer project. Okay, the theoretical uh, framework, let's say, is based on the Civicus uh, Civil Society Index. I'm, I, I think some of the audiences here are familiar with this um, organization or the research project. It is a, an international research project that includes more than uh, 50 countries, and they try to establish a kind of uh, civil society map of each country, and they want to do this on the international level. Of course, our research is based or focusing on the media field, so it's not all the uh, civil society organizations like the Civicus does, but we are uh, somehow basing our theoretical framework on theirs, because their model is really debated and refined throughout the history of more than 10 years. Therefore, we want to use some of the definitions that are on the theoretical level, uh, that are used by the Silicus group, and there the definition is quite basic, the one that we see at the arena, and simply we see the civil society as the arena, outside of the family, the state and the market, where people associate to advance common interests. Of course, these definitions are based on the international level by the Silicus, but when you come to Turkish case, of course, these definitions, the theoretical definitions need to be uh, adapted because understanding of civil society is not exactly the same in Turkey with elsewhere. Uh, elsewhere, for instance, in Turkish and uh, the, uh, literature on um, civil society, we see a kind of double relation. Let's say double dimension of civil society. While on one hand, it is seen as a field where different forms of organi organizations or the individuals come together to advance their interests, so they use it positively for their interests. But the second dimension of the Turkish literature on civil society highlights the abuse of the civil society, mostly by the state organs or the companies. So there is this double side, as we are familiar with all over the world. Okay, so we somehow adapt this uh, theoretical framework of civicus to Turkish case. Um, and then, for instance, one of the very, uh, let's say, symbolic adaptation steps is the use of the, the verbs that we use in Turkish language. Uh, to you to <coughs> explain NGO. NGO in English is non-governmental organization, but in Turkish we use it, we doesn't use it as a literal translation of it, but we say civil society organization. So even this difference of translation means that in Turkish context it's not the same as uh, all in all other uh, research areas of the city. So therefore we did a kind of adaptation of the theoretical framework. Uh, the first step of our research um, is kind of providing uh, an old outline of the media landscape in Turkey because I will just give some uh, examples of the uh, research objects that we focus on 
there are on one hand, for instance, investigative journalist foundations that are focusing on particular field of journalism. While on the other hand, if you turn to the broadcasting field, you would see, for instance, radio and TV broadcasters associations or Eurasian newspapers, publishers, kind of organizations that are more focused on broadcasting areas. If you switch your look to the other side, you see lots of organizations, NGOs, working in the cinema film sector. And there are, of course, telecom and IT field, which is a component of media, broad media field, and maybe part of party relates to this one, actually, telecommunication and IT field, more than the others. Um, and what do they do differs as well, other than their sectors. Uh, they sometimes focus on self-regulation, like in the case of journalist associations, or sometimes on the monitoring, for instance, granting foundation focuses on particular monitoring of hate speech in Turkish media sector, or you see deliberation, networking, sponsorship, or advocacy, uh, let's say, focused organizations. So we're talking about really diverse types and focuses when we talk about different NGOs in media. <coughs> So, on this step, I will leave uh, to my colleague Brock to give some more concrete examples about the findings of the research, and then on the conclusions part, I will take that. So, um, I'm going to basically talk about the findings of the research, and before doing that, I'm going to uh, define the media environment, media landscape in Turkey, because most of you are not. Uh, I think so, not really familiar with that. So Turkey has a very vibrant media industry. Uh, however, media ownership in Turkey is highly concentrated uh, by a number of private media companies. So those companies are uh, owned by stakeholders who have also their investments in other fields, most of which are banking, trade, sorry, building trade and energy. So <coughs> media content concentration is threatening the uh, journalistic operations. But it's not the only problem we have. Uh, when the Justice and, the Justice and Development Party took over, they had uh, excessive taxation. They had imposed excessive taxation uh, to those media companies opposing the government. And the government had acquired bankrupt media firms and sold them to capital owners who are close to the ruling party. So this has turned into a state policy and uh, has resulted in the polarization of media. So today, Turkey is now ranked as the 154th in the Press Freedom Index. So the scope of media-related NGOs can be depicted at two fields, as Altu has just mentioned. So there are NGOs operating in the field of media, and also <coughs> there are NGOs which sustain activities relevant to the media field. So at the first level, NGOs operating in the field of media can be listed regarding their sectors based, based on like uh, sectors like journalism, broadcasting, cinema, telecommunications, and information technologies. Each of these sectors enclose uh, a variety of NGOs that maintain field specific operations. However, they are also, uh, they, are, they are generally uh, have connections with, with other sectors. So at the second level, NGOs can be explored regarding to their, their functions like self regulation, monitoring, deliberation, research and networking, sponsorship, or advocacy. So their activities are intertwined to cover an extensive field of uh, practices. But the essential function of media, uh, media related NGOs in Turkey is bringing together uh, its members or uniting them. So for instance, Photojournalist Association of Turkey unites primarily, primarily a subgroup of journalists in the country and in a similar way, Izmir uh, Journalist Association, which we have conducted a research, or we uh, have made some interviews with them. They aim to reinforce solidarity among its members, yet with particular goals such as promoting journalism, fighting for freedom of the press, and empowering uh, the rights of media workers. Another form of action followed by these media related NGOs is engaging in conventional media production activities such as publishing daily newspapers or magazines, and besides, they um, have pamphlets, flyers, and other kinds of informative material, uh, and they are being circulated to raise public, pub, public awareness. So, <coughs> for instance, here, uh, maybe you are familiar with that organization, Alternative Informatics Association. They publish, uh, they have published so far several e-books, 
online, and then uh, they did mostly work on hacktivism and data production. And additionally, they published reports two times in a year on the status of the internet. So, <coughs> NGOs, I mean, regarding the workforce sources, uh, uh, NGOs are usually organized as associations. Uh, I mean, this is uh, like, it comes with advantages with, uh, as well as with disadvantages. Uh, as uh, stated by the uh, board member of, board member of uh, photojournalist association, the NGOs are taken more seriously by the authorities and the public when they are organized as associations rather than platforms or collectives. So furthermore, there are uh, particular advantages like uh, the right to collect donations without any permissions or like uh, tax exemption. Yet, being an association brings a lot of uh, bureaucratic work. So, labor union structure, as we know so far in Turkey, doesn't work because most of the um, employers would not permit their uh, workers to, to uh, you know, become uh, union members. So, that's a basic problem. So, here, uh, I think it's important to underline that both photojournalist association, for instance, and the Izmir journalist association are professional associations which require uh, membership for specific, specific kind of professions. Uh, yet in our technology, there are other NGOs which are not professional associations, rather they are uh, civil society organizations. And <coughs> these work on, like as uh, non-profit citizen organiza organizations, mainly for uh, public benefit rather than uh, member benefit. Uh, here, I want to give an example again for the uh, Alternative Informatics as Association. They work for public good rather than uh, for members. Their works are uh, mainly organized around possible benefits to the society, fundamentally around uh, informing the society about censorship, citizens' rights, surveillance, legal support for, uh, you know, against censorship issues. And also, uh, they uh, expose the potential use of new media. Similarly, uh, another organization, Blackpink uh, Triangle, which is a civil society organization which works on uh, transgender issues, uh, they try to inform and educate the uh, society about these uh, areas. So, <coughs> NGOs uh, sustain their activities by utilizing two major forms of sources, human sources and financial sources. Lack of professional labor force or relying much on volunteer work uh, is a problem for associations because uh, they, you know, the volunteers are really, uh, they, they, they attend for short terms now. They don't really uh, frequently uh, go on meetings and stuff. So that's a, that's a major problem for them. And uh, regarding the financial resources, there are different types of uh, monetary sources like membership fees, donations, income from NGOs operations, there is the state funding, sponsorships, and as well as we have uh, funds coming from different institutions, including the international ones. So, uh, regarding the relational aspect, I'm trying to, I will try to uh, illustrate it in uh, four aspects. As you can see on the, uh, on the screen, we have relations with the NGOs, we have relations with, uh, I mean, at the international level, we have relations with the state and also with the media since we are working on media-related NGOs. So, uh, relations with the NGOs, you know, it's like uh, not too complicated. They all have collaborations with NGOs. They, um, in a context, uh, organize seminars, press conferences. They also get in touch with unions and other uh, trade bodies. They try to bring them together. However, uh, these relationships are mostly based on uh, individual, uh, you know, individual practices. So, this is not really a healthy way of doing it. So, <coughs> Ali Riza has told us from the Alternative uh, Informatics Association, he said, we don't have relationships with the NGOs that remain close to stakeholders. Instead, we maintain close, close relationship with the NGOs that tend to work on rights and freedom issues. And, yeah, some of them uh, either come <coughs> part of different organizations. So one member can be another member of another institution. So relations at the international level uh, takes mostly forms of visits of uh, observations. Uh, and most of the visits are planned for uh, the purpose of exchanging opinions. And also 
Uh, they try to extend their networks for, uh, with, by, by joining uh, different civil society organizations abroad. And there are also some practical and uh, logistic reasons as well as methods like prestige here. Uh, the most complicated form of relationship is the one uh, with the state. So uh, this is partly due to the historical fact that the state's apparatus has vast domination in social life. So <coughs> these relationships between the state and the NGOs is mostly based on legal regulations. Here, each association has to register itself to the association's directorate at the local level. Without doing this, uh, it becomes illegal and their operations are not permitted. So, apart from the obligatory relations, representatives of the NGOs are at the same time, or can be at the same time, members of the institutions linked to the state. For instance, uh, Attila Sartal uh, is the uh, executive director of the uh, Izmir Journalist Association. He is also a member of the Press Cars Commission and the director general of the Press Advertisement. So, he has connections with the state. Okay. Um, Although there is this relationship close to the state, there are some other NGOs which uh, almost have no relations with the state because uh, the state somehow ideologically uh, rejects them. We have the uh, Black Pink Triangle, as I have uh, given the example, you know, the, they are working on transgender issues. So uh, the state does not accept to collaborate with these kind of institutions working on issues like trust, gender, or, or, or uh, sex, sex workers. So there are some ways of bypassing the situation as the uh, black team triangle does. They just uh, bypass the lack of dialogue by uh, keeping relations with the state uh, based on uh, establishing coalitions uh, or, or uh, they, they uh, become members of federations or uh, they collaborate with other umbrella organizations. So that's not a direct way of communicating with the state, but there are some indirect ways of, of doing it. So relations with the media uh, is mostly uh, based on the work of job security. However, um, NGOs in general are incapable of uh, securing workers' positions in Turkey. So um, you know that the union model uh, doesn't work. So fundamentally, the members remain under the pressure of their institutions. You know, when they uh, want to, uh, you know become a member of the labor union, for instance. So uh, I will pass it to all two for conclusions, uh, for other kind of findings. So. <coughs> well, uh, understanding the uh, media-related organizations in the Bordasian, uh, the sense of field theory, uh, it naturally brings us to the uh, conclusion that the structural transformations on the national and international level reflect very clearly on the field of media, such as the transformation, for instance, regarding the technologies. For instance, when we talked about, talked with the uh, photojournalist association, they were, as a, as a professional organization that tries to uh, advance the interests of their members, they complain really much about the, the degradation, uh, degrading value of their work thanks to the uh, changes in the photo world technologically. Said so now everybody is a, uh, everybody is a photojournalist, so our value in, our, in the companies that we work on are degrading, so our job conditions, our social security rights and everything is degrading, so we try to keep this up for our members. So even this is a very clear, let's say, reflection of the changes of the let's say, technological field on the field of media. So that kind of structure transformations, this also includes the economical, uh, let's say, ownership structures and etc. And also the ideological changes in the country, like we observe in Turkish case, are reflecting very clearly on the media field, and that is that can be observed on the NGOs as well. Um, regarding the cooperation with the con uh, with the other NGOs, because we we, we are very careful because uh, of focusing on the relational aspects. Uh, it's obvious that different forms of NGOs exist, but some of their aims, some of their purposes, as well as the energies that they waste, are somehow intersecting and actually uh, furthering the cooperation and collaboration among uh, the uh, NGOs that are somehow operating in similar, let's say, uh, topics should definitely increase the, the efficiency of these NGOs. Because now, for instance, uh, the other day we made an interview with the ILAD, which is um, 
Communication Research Association of Turkey, so this is most academics working on the field of media, uh, they complain that uh, there are other organizations similar to uh, what they do. However, due to some personal problems among the, let's say, directors of the organizations, they cannot cooperate. So we have two organizations working in the same field, trying to do the same things, but they are separate. So this is a very, let's say, chronic case in Turkish civil sector. This this reflects on the media they can do as well. Um, and uh, the main, main one of the main conclusions should be on the way that the state relations uh, are uh, making the case more complicated, especially in the case of media, because of uh, the media field's importance in the indoctrination or the, let's say, uh, creation of the public, uh, let's say, opinions. Uh, therefore, the independence of the NGOs is a very tricky situation in the case of uh, Turkish media NGOs. On one hand, there is this resource problem, on the other hand, the state uh, for instance, again, another interview from the same organization told that we are really very careful about getting funding from the state. We, we don't get the funding from the state because if we do, we know that they will demand a lot. Oh, but on the other hand, they need these funds. Therefore, their solution is going to EU or EU related agencies for funding in order to keep their independence from Turkish state. So th this is a very classical case. On one hand, you have finance or resource, let's say resource problems that will be finance. Uh, but <coughs> getting these public funds from Turkish state makes your position very, let's say, problematic in regards to the independence. And this was very clearly stated at least in three or four organizations we talked so far. Um, and finally, uh, maybe this might be the last conclusion that we arrived. At the end of the day, the NGOs, again going back to the main theoretical definition, uh, exist in order to unite people, in the uh, individuals for different causes. So it comes, in, this, in Turkish case at least, comes to the position that uh, the, uh, putting people together, either the workers in the media field or the ones who are interested in the media field, like the academics, uh, is an issue that gets very, very uh, difficult due to different reasons. But one of the solutions, as in the case of Pirate, my, Pirate, Pirate, my, uh, Pirate Party, it, uh, can be maybe speculated that, as we see in the case of alternative uh, informatics association, is this loose association uh, forms. Because the stricter the, the unions or the uh, organizations or let's say uh, associations or foundations, which are uh, organizations formed of maybe an earlier decade, cannot be applied to the organizations that are looking for new sources, especially the younger sources. Not all, I'm not talking about finance here, I'm talking about the workforce. So maybe the Pirates Party model might be an inspiration in Turkish case, and actually uh, in our interview with the Pirates Party and uh, alternative informative associations, this was one of the solutions they found in order to, um, let's say, spread their influence and improve their uh, workforce. So we are open to questions and answers. Thanks very much. Is there any question? Um, I don't know if uh, I remember correctly, but I think it was also activists from the Alternative Informatics Association that are calling for this boycott of the Internet Governance Board. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, have you discussed uh, this issue with them? Because I'm really wondering about um, where, uh, whether it's, uh, well, how, how useful it is to build um, such connections on an international level if it means having to accept at the same time kind of in, uh, problematic uh, international uh, structures uh, to work with and basically how much to work with the system. The, the research, uh, for the research, uh, we did our interview with them much earlier than what happened recently, but maybe on personal level we have some uh, feelings of uh, rejection, but I'm not the one that really knows. I don't know if you have any opinion. Uh. Last day, I was talking with Sahat uh, from the Pirate Party. Uh, he told me the same thing, and I think uh, that you're right. This is like uh, rejecting the uh, you know, power mechanisms. I mean, top-down things, and coming up from with something from bottom to top. But this is not really the case. I think I don't know, but uh, 
Sir, as Sir has told me, uh, there are some issues which are going to be discussed uh, during the IGF, but uh, alternative informatics association has, you know, uh, made a declaration, and in that declaration they said, these topics are not really discussed, and we have sent them papers, and they were rejected. So I think they have sent four papers, and they were all rejected. So they wanted to come up with something different to, you know, maybe to signify something. Yeah. But still, we shouldn't be talking about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not the, not the one. Maybe. Is there any more question? I wasn't going to ask question. I was talking. I, was, I, did, I wanted to talk about this issue in Turkey. There, this is a big issue. Great, uh, it's awful for us. I'm uh, a spokesperson for Pirate Pirates Turkey, by the way. Uh, Alternative Information Association is the only association in Turkey that deals with the same issues with Pirate Party, and uh, we share the same members. In fact, in these two groups. An alternative formation association does something like that, like on governance forum, and and in their declaration they didn't say that we applied and rejected. They said that in IGF there is uh, no uh, topics about internet censorship and digital surveillance things, so we are protesting it. So Turkey, uh, when you needs a collaboration, we need an understanding between so few groups fighting for internet uh, freedom. I think. This actually relates to, I mean, even this situation relates to some of the conclusions that we reached so far in this pilot research. Uh, this is not only about uh, the pirate party and alternative IS association, which are really very similar actually, the purposes, their causes, their uh, philosophy. But uh, this separation of, or let's say um, fragmentation of, uh, civil society is only in Turkey is a, is a really a chronic problem. And I really uh, hope that some of the problems that seem to uh, originate from really personal dislikes and like really like personal psychological dislikes can be uh, somehow uh, overcome with the use of new forming organizational methods such as uh, like really web-based anonymous uh, organizational things that uh, minimizes the uh, potential personal or psychological dislikes, because really in Turkey we suffer a lot from this. This is not only about this case at all, I mean this is very broad. Uh, just one example about uh, journalistic associations in one of the towns, uh, Kiris, which is a very tiny town on the south uh, Syrian border, border uh, which has 100,000 uh, occupants. There are five different journalistic associations. That doesn't make sense, there are 26 or 27 journalists there. <laughs> But there are five organizations. So uh, I really see that, I, yeah, we, this is a power field. We know that, uh, again, from Bumbu, that in each field there are power struggles and interest, uh, conflict of interest. But at the end of the day, uh, really, uh, this cannot be tolerated. And this is not sustainable at all. And uh, what happens is after a while, these five, uh, two of the five organizations, or three maybe, will disappear uh, with uh, such a big disappointment for the members. So, I mean, this is one of the actually hopes that uh, at the end of the research, this long research, we will come up with some suggestions to uh, overcome that uh, fr uh, massive fragmentation. And not in every field, by the way, you can be see the same situation. In cinema field, there is less of a separation. But in journalism, the first is huge, enormous. Maybe it's about the egos of the journalists, I don't know what's the reason. Uh, but we will try to reach to a kind of suggestion by the end of the research. This is only the pilot findings, so we don't want to really uh, build a lot on them so far. And probably we are going to come up with our own platform, own uh, network. Yeah. Yeah. This is actually an important yeah, thing. Yeah, that, that's the uh, main idea of this research. I mean, we began, uh, I mean, Alto has that idea. You know, as the members of the academia, uh, we have realized that we are uh, kind of separate from the civil society. So our campus areas are located not in the city centers, but you know, just uh, like in the suburban areas. So uh, we didn't want to be separated from the society. We just wanted to be in it. We wanted to collaborate. We wanted to open up new areas in civil society. So we see this work as our social responsibility, and you know, uh, we are going to, in the long run, uh, you know, bring together some people who are working in the field of media. 
So don't media about like uh, any kind of things, like translation or book, from, yeah, book, 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 book yeah. publishing or from photography to videos and anything you can yeah. Yeah, imagine. Maybe I should say this at the very beginning. This research is based on a need that we feel ourselves. We want to see the topography that who are the organizations. There are so much of them, but what do they do? So what are the gaps that we can maybe fill in with our own initiative? This was the main idea of starting this research. Kind of personal, uh, let's say, <laughs> need. I guess no more question. Thank you all. Have a nice time. Thanks very much.